Okay, welcome to my talk. My name is Grayson Bielak. My supervisor is Don Cummings, and we're going to be examining the geomorphology of the Exeter Lake Esker using the Arctic DEM and low elevation flyover footage. I'm going to try to go through this quite quick because the last few times I recorded this, it took me 25 minutes. So hopefully I can get through it. This is our study area. This is the Exeter Lake Esker here in black. It extends from the Blount Lake over here to Exmouth Lake, starting in the Thelon Basin, across the Thelon Tectonic Zone, across the Slave Craton, and terminating in the Watt May origin. A big question to keep in mind as I go through this presentation is do eskers form as time transgressive segments in short conduits near the ice margin or as long conduits beneath a more stagnant ice sheet? In this model, most of our geomorphological work is being uh, done here at the ice margin, whereas in the long conduit model, some of our geomorphological elements are explained by changes in uh, the dimensions of the subglacial channel through cavities. So our data set includes a low elevation flyover footage from a GoPro 8. Here it is rolling. I'm going to take snapshots of this and I'm going to show you some changes in the ESCO as we go. We're going to combine that with the two meter Arctic DEM right here. This is our Esker ridge on our DEM. Uh, traditionally, Eskers have been mapped as chevrons or lines. So this is the Aylesworth and Schultz 2012 shape file of the Exeter Lake Esker. And then this is ours where I am trying to identify some of these different geomorphological elements, including single crested ridges in blue, uh, single flat top ridges in light blue, wide, unconstrained bodies, or maybe broad bodies is a better term, ridge court, I'm going to say unconstrained today, and then some broad unconstrained bodies without a ridge. So our, our sample suite contains uh, 26 stops, sampling each the tail and the esker at these stops. Uh, we're going to be combining that or looking at that data for provenance, grain size, and grain morphology to kind of determine where these elements of the esker are coming from. And to get started on the geomorphology, we're going to start way down here at Dewant Lake, and we're going to look at this little sliver going up into our first uh, sample site. So let's get started. This is how the Exeter Lake esker starts, kind of unceremoniously, as this really low-lying, uh, maybe glacial, well, I think it's glacial fluvial sediment. We'll see as we go forward. We have a kettle lake, and this is a raised topographic ridge here, and we have another topographic ridge right here. So this is a very early Esker system. This is how it starts. It's going to tail off. So here we see the ridge actually quite nicely right here, and a kettle lake. And it's going to tail off into this bedrock. We see a bit of sand here, and we're actually going to zoom up to this sediment body right here. This is where we first really see our Esker system taking shape. We have these uh, flat top bodies, this crested body, and then kind of coming into these wide broad bodies. Maybe we'll call this, you know, some flanking outwash or some kind of fan setting if we're going to put interpretation on it. So for now, we have flat topped ridge, really flat topped ridge here, crested ridge, and then some unconfined or some broad sediment bodies. Moving forward across our esker, we see we have another kettle lake. We're going to jump across to the lake here. Look at this multi crested segment. With abundant kettle lakes, it looks like these kettle lakes are definitely having an influence on our multi-crested morphology. These crests are all going around the kettle lakes as if we had some kind of ice obstruction there or the ice has melted and resulted in this, in this morphology. Moving forward, we see more kettle lakes and our crested ridge segment. We're going to jump up here. Another multi-crested kettle lake ridge segment and a flat topped ridge. And then in the distance, we see these kind of unconstrained blobs of sediment. They're very broad, they look very sandy and pebbly, and they are discontinuous. We'll see those on the DEM coming up. So we have two stops here, 1908 or, or 008 and uh, 009. This is on top of the Esker. As we see at 008, here we are, this broad, flat, sandy expanse. Hard to get a sense of the topography, but we are standing above it. Here we have a, a, a very pebble rich gra uh, armor on top of the esker and then it's going to be very sand rich at depth and it plotted over here on our graph or our ternary plot. And then this is our diamicton sample, also extreme, well it's not a diamicton sample, I think this is a tail sample, but it wound up being very sandy. Maybe this is a, a artifact of the Dubois, same with the color here, it's a very uh, red sand, sandstone rich kind of area. So this is how it all looked on the DEM. We recall we started with these little hardly ridge segments. This is the first real S group we saw with our flat top body. In green here, this is the multi crested segments. This is a singular crested segment. And then light blue is our flat top segments. And purple are these wide, broad, you know, um, kind of hard to define bodies. And red is our meltwater corridor. So if we zoom in on this section that we already looked at, we'll see how we kind of use these pictures to inform our mapping. 
if this is what it looks like on the DEM, when I look at it here, this broad unconfined body is very apparent, whereas it's quite cryptic on the Arctic DEM. So by combining this, we get a you know, much better sense of you know, the geomorphology we're mapping when we're mapping on the Arctic DEM. The next section we're going to look at is right here in the middle of the slave craton where this tributary esker joins, and then it's going to, we're going to follow it down flow. So this is the first part we're going to look at. Right here, we have the tributary esker, two eskers joining. They're going to result in this uh, broad, you know, unconstrained sediment body, converts back into a ridge, becomes multi-crested, then flat crested, and terminates in these uh, flat topped terminal bodies. And then we're going to look at this section, section, second section here coming up next. So first, we're going to start right down here where this arrow is. Here's our esker crest. Moving forward, we see our second esker coming together and here's where they are combining. This is their area of confluence and we have this large flat topped unconstrained ridge and a body or broad body on top. We have a till sample down here and an esker crest sample right here. And then as the plane turns, we see our esker kind of coalesce right here and it's gonna carry a crown across the river. How it looks on the ground, we have, this is our till plotting nicely in a diamicton. And then we have again, a, a very pebble rich gravel um, on the surface, uh, a little coarser and uh, not nearly as red as we noticed in the Devant. Some pointers, so we go across, we see we wind up where they coalesce, we have this really round crested esker segment, which we go forward and has become this very narrow ridge. Uh, so as we go, you know, uh, there's some things to keep in mind as I talked about with the short versus long conduit model. One thing I think about with these ridge segments is, is this a pre-existing you know, feature of a, initial network of our channels and then we have uh, a later deposition of some of these uh, you know what you'd call fans or deltaic bodies you know where those two eskers combined and we had a much wider channel deposited on top of our originally narrow channel when this wideness has became more marginal going along we see it becomes flat top tier and it ends in two large flat top segments as we terminate in this body of water right here is a nice close-up of the two the two flat top segments at the end. And here we kind of see our esker crest go through. We're going to stop here and we're going to go look at the second section where we start with a very uh, multi-crested ridge, which is going to become very irregular, uh, ridge constrained wide body, a singular ridge, and then wide again. So here's our singular crested ridge. It's going to become multi-crested up top and this is our unconstrained sediment body ahead. So here's our multi-crested ridge. Here we see a main ridge and then we, here we have these other multiple ridges flanking it. Um, maybe this is a feature, you know, this used to be ice cored and then it melted out and these are, you know, slump features or something. It doesn't appear to be as kettle-like driven, but could still be ice uh, slump features. We see something similar over here. We have, uh, you know, small detached bodies with some evidence of slumping, but we have some very large detached bodies here with significant evidence of slumping as if maybe, these were deposited on top of the ice. So these were ice cored originally, the ice melted out and that's how we got this topography. Maybe we're looking at some kind of a cold toe marginal feature where um, our esker is being deposited on top of uh, ice at the, very, at the very ice margins. And then we're seeing a melt out and get this morphology. As we follow it forward, we come to this unconstrained ridge cord segment or is this a multi-crested ridge? This is, uh, this is a very interesting portion of the esker. You know, was this once flat topped and has this, uh, is this all caused from the amount of, of subglacial or subterranean ice? We see we transition to a singular crested ridge again, ridge again, quite abruptly. So we have a massive amount of sediment and transitioning to a singular crested red ridge. Hard to envision an environment where we're forming these at the same time. So again, going back to that idea of, you know, we have a, a ridge system forming first, followed by, you know, a widening of our R channel at a later point and depositing more of this, you know, outwash or fan sediment. We have two samples here. So another till and another esker. Here's what it looks like on the esker. So very gravel rich, um, our most gravel rich sample we've had. And then our till sample plotting down here, typically in our diamicton. As we move forward, we will see that this ridge is going to terminate again in some kind of, maybe this is another ice margin. So maybe this is our marginal setting. And this is our subglacial setting right here, and then our ice margin here. And we see a couple of these kind of time transgressively going backwards. And as we follow it forward, again, here's our central ridge and maybe our outwash going forward. And then as it terminates, we'll see it kind of dissipates. 
into nothing, we get a break and we'll pick it back up here. Uh, we're not gonna see that though, but here's our single ridge right there again. So we're gonna look at one more, one more chunk just at the end here. So we kind of get a sense at the beginning, the middle and the end of the study area. We're gonna look at a first transition here where we're gonna look at two singly crested ridges, which are gonna coalesce into this multi-crested segment into this wide sediment body. And then we're going to go over here and we're going to look at this singular crested ridge later. So starting here, we'll see we have, we're going to start right over here. Actually, this is where our plane is. We're going to see these segments going over some bedrock, combining with another esker, multi-crested, and then a very, very wide center of body. So here is our singular crested ridge onto the bedrock. We see it's quite diffuse over the bedrock. Here's a small segment of our esker. Here's our other ridge in the distance that we are going to combine with bit of fluvial sediment right here, it looks like. Then we coalesce and we get this very broad multi-crested segment, maybe with some previous kettle lakes on top. And then we have uh, a kettle lake right here as well. And possibly uh, a ridge, a ridge which uh, cores this large sprawling sediment body. If we go forward, you see our ridge carries forward. And again, comes out as this kind of unremarkable small scale feature as if we deposited, you know, this sediment on top of this after we had formed this as this widened, um, you know, either at the ice margin or, in, you know, some kind of massive flooding event. There's probably a couple of environments we could think of where we'd get something like this. So going forward, we see that our esker kind of is going to become this classical representation of the esker, something that I'm familiar, or I think we'll all be familiar with seeing, which is just uniform crested, with some flanking out wash to the sides here. We're gonna pick it up over here. We're gonna see the esker starts very similarly as to it did. This is where we just kind of ended over here. We're gonna see a similar morphology of a singular crested ridge. This is the flanking out wash transitioning to flat topped then our last two sample sites. So here's our crested esker segment and here's our flanking out wash transitioning to a flat topped ridge as we approach this large body of lake or this large body of water. And then we're going to hop across the body of water See this broad flat top ridge again, transitioning to crested, back to wide flat topped, and back to crested. So we're seeing multiple transitions or multiple changes in morphology that I think are quite difficult to explain just by um, you know changes in the nature of the conduit. You know, I think we're looking at changes in environment. So here's our, our final sample site of the the, the transect. Here at 006, uh, this is our crested ridge. And we zoom in, we see it's very boulder rich. This is honestly what I really think of when I think of Esker segments. Um, very boulder rich, uh, very organic heavy, hard to dig, lots of cobbles. And down here we see it plotted on the sand. I, I'll just point out that uh, these were coming from a, a matrix sample, this data. We took out pebbles and cobbles for a pebble lithology study that are underrepresented here. So a lot of these plotting down here in the sand would actually be plotting up here in the gravel for our esker crests. So that is the extent of our study area. Uh, what are some of the geomorphological elements that we have seen? We've seen abundant kettle lakes. Um, here we see a kettle lake here, a bunch influencing the morphology of our ridge here. Some more kettle lakes flanking our esker system here. And this is you know, evidence of you know, uh, lots of subterranean ice. I think, you know, we either have deposition on top of the ice at the ice front, or we have buried ice within the channel, but it's definitely not always flowing on bedrock. It looks like we are uh, flowing on, uh, you know, some type of ice at the same time, multi-crested. So is this influenced by the kettle lakes? I think so. I think it's a good explanation or a good place to start, I guess, to explain the morphology. Of some of these features, I've seen them uh, described as you know plugs in the conduit. The conduit becomes occluded, and then we flow adjacent to it. I don't think that's quite what's going on. I think it has to do with the presence of subterranean ice. Again, here maybe this is you know used, maybe this used to be flat topped, and this is all slumped features from the meltout of ice. Uh, and then here again, maybe some erosional erosional features influencing our multi-crested morphology. Flat top segments we. We frequently observe these uh, terminating into large bodies of water. So here we have a flat top segment terminating into a large lake, flat topped into a large lake, another flat topped you know, set of units, the unconstrained bodies and the Esker Ridge, terminating into a large lake. Um, Carson, I think 1943, conducted an experiment you know, where they adjusted the hydraulic, the hydraulic head in, the Esker, in an Esker model or that they had 
in their lab. And they found that, you know, as the surface of the water went below the height of the tunnel, you form these flat top segments. So are, you know, do we have a subglacial cavity here? Uh, are we depositing our water into a subglacial cavity? The water level is going down below the head of our ridge and that's how we're getting this flat top segment. Uh, Burke uh, also pointed out that um, you can have a lot of these flat top segments forming an open channel flow. So either, you know, it's maybe some kind of subglacial cavity or an open channel, but definitely not a, a water saturated R channel is what we're looking at for these. That would be more like our singular crested ridge where we have this nice well-defined um, R channel, which frequently has, you know, evidence of slump features on other sides if this was stacked higher than it should be beyond the angle of repose. And we also see they kind of fluctuate between really wide bodies and this ridge, giving us the sense that our ridge was here well before this. You know, these would be very hard, you know, environments to have coexisting simultaneously. Planking outwash is very common in our Esker system. This to me speaks of widening of the R channel at a later date. So we have our R channel deposited here, and then maybe we transition to an open channel environment where we can deposit this material adjacent to our Esker system. So in summary, uh, wide evidence, uh, wide scale evidence of subterranean ice, flanking outwash is common, multi-crested segments might be a result of this, um, of this subterranean ice. Flat top segments are observed in close proximity to lakes or terminal points. You know, maybe this is our water level going down as it uh, you know, collects in these topographic lows, which are now represented by lakes. Alternatively, they could be um, evidence of open channel flows. Single ridges, you know, occur as our sudden transitions. And, you know, maybe this is not really as sudden as it appears. These are just two different periods in time kind of deposited on top of each other, as you see here and here. So do we see evidence of, you know, time transgressive or sickness deposition when we look at the Esker? Well, I think we see more evidence for a short conduit model than a long. Uh, just by all of the variation we see in geomorphology in the local scale, I think, you know, some of those transects were only around 20 kilometers and we're seeing, you know, three or four transitions from very narrow bodies to very wide bodies. And it would be difficult to explain that purely through changes in the morphology of the conduit itself. You know, I think those are more reflections of changes in environment. Future work, we are going to incorporate LIDAR and air photos in our geomorphology. So we have LIDAR donated to us by, oh, I forgot, it's at the end. And uh, so we have this, this uh, industry donated LIDAR set and our Esker Ridge, if we look at it here in the LIDAR, we see this terminal fan and these shoreline, these shoreline deposits and these possible beads are much more apparent compared to our, our DEM. Incorporate pebble lithology and geochemical provenance data um, into our Esker transect. This will give us a really good idea of where our sediment is coming from and how far it's traveled. Add Z data to our arc map and calculate a mass balance of the Esker and the meltwater corridor. So we're just gonna try to you know, get a cross-sectional area of our meltwater corridor, get a cross-sectional area of our Esker and determine, you know, do we have a, a, is there a surplus of sediment indicating we're sourcing sediment from more than just the meltwater channel? Is there a negative or does it balance? And then we have a foot traverse uh, imagery donated to us by Dwayne Volgamuth. He walked the length of the Exeter Lake Esker this summer. He reached out to me for some um, advice about the system. We got to talking. He took these textural pictures of the surface for us every 300 meters. Um, they're beautiful. They really give us a sense of the grain size. And once we incorporate this into the data set, we'll have a really good idea of what we are looking with or what we are working with on our, on our, on our data set. Um, so that is everything. Thank you to uh, Barrett and Phil from the NTGS, Aurora College for the research license, Dominion Diamond Mines, John Carlson specifically for the LIDAR. We really uh, appreciate that. Dwayne Volgamuth for the textual images and CERC for the funding. Uh, NTGS for funding, Carlton for funding, Aurora Geoscience for the research license. Thank you very much to my talk, my talk. Hopefully I got that all in there in 20 minutes.